I've had the privilege to spend quite a bit of time with you guys over the last couple months to talk about your personal values as individuals, as a family, as uh, entrepreneurs and uh, business leaders. And um, that's what we want to talk about today. Uh, take a look at uh, you know the, the values that have shaped you as uh, people, as a family, and uh, uh, Schlegel Villages as an organization over time. And uh, yeah, we want to run through those one by one, just to look at you know where they come from, uh, what they mean to you, and um, how they also uh, find expression within the organization. It was actually a really valuable experience to spend time with you talking about the values, and um, we talk a lot about the family culture mm -hmm. with new team members and and, and the entire organization, and uh, how important the family culture is to. Uh, to the Schlegel Village organization. Mm -hmm. And uh, the culture is really comprised of these values and to spend time actually talking about the values, what they mean, and also working a little bit at whether we were most effectively describing them. Mm -hmm. And in fact, you know, sharpening uh, and, and, and improving on the description of those values, I think right. was a worthwhile exercise, both talking about the values themselves, but also how we describe them. Right, right. Well, they are foundational, right? So the values are kind of eternal, yeah. but um, we want to make sure we're describing them properly mm -hmm. and so that they're meaningful for not just us, but for the organization. Mm -hmm. And people can relate to um, them, the, vision, the, um, the values. Um, when they think about their role in the organization, they can relate back easily to mm -hmm. how we've described the values. So mm -hmm. it's important. To, language is important, right? Language is important and culture is important. As we grow, we realize how vital the, the culture is to the organization and to our success. It's mm -hmm. the ethos within which everything happens. Yeah. And uh, the, all the innovative programs, all the research-driven innovation, uh, all the excellence that occurs within an organization happens within the culture. And the cu mm -hmm. culture is really the, the environment within which everything else happens. And so as we grow, as we uh, moving to new communities, we think more and more about how we make sure that culture remains strong through all this. So what are the values? Uh, I think a big part of the exercise was really trying to narrow it down and, and dealing with overlaps because obviously it's, you know, one, one thing is, you know, put these things into words, but then when you start really diving into the discussion, all of a sudden you realize, you know, how they all interconnect and kind of create this really coherent uh, entity. Uh, but nevertheless, I think we, we came up with six sets of, um, of values. The first value is genuine and humble. Uh, the second one is hardworking and hands-on. The third one is caring relationships. The fourth one is persistence and passion. The fifth one is positive can-do attitude. And the sixth and final one is creative and innovative. So I would suggest let's run through them one by one. They, they should challenge us every day. Yeah. And what we do when we get up in the morning, we think about, you know, am I living up these values and how do I express these should values? Challenge us and also give us guidance mm -hmm. uh, in, our, in terms of the way we behave and the way we act and treat each other. The and decisions we make. The decisions we make, yeah. I was just going to add that, uh, just to go back a little bit, we have a vision and uh, we have a mission. And... Uh, all that is built upon our values. Mm -hmm. So the, the, it's our foundation and on which we, you know, uh, format our vision and how do we go about trying to realize our mission. Exactly. Yeah, so no, it's in that context. We talk a lot about uh, the, the values being the foundation of the organization, the foundation upon which we build the modern organization. And where does it come mission. from? Yeah. I think uh, to uh, relate it to a person at least, uh, my father uh, personified all of these values and uh, lived them on a daily basis. Yeah, and I, if, I, if we could identify a second person, it'd be you in terms of you, you having lived these values uh, the same way Grandpa did, having, I guess, learned from him and observed him. So the most salient one, you know, to start with is uh, humble, genuine and humble. And uh, he didn't try to be someone he wasn't. You know, he, he was just himself. And uh, he could relate very easily to anybody, all walks of life. 
You know, he would often, we lived at Elsa Craig, west of, west of London, about a half an hour. He would go to town for the day to do business, and uh, he would maybe go into a store, and he would get into a, a 10 minute conversation with a clerk uh, as he's paying his, uh, paying his bill. And uh, he, he, would, he related to that person. And, uh, oh, and he took a genuine interest in them. He took a genuine interest in them, and, uh, and it wasn't about him, it was, it was about others. And, also, and after that 10 minute conversation, he would have know, known quite a bit about the yeah. person and their life story and so on. He got to know them in 10 minutes. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and he, he uh, related to uh, young people. He took a special interest in, uh, in youth and teenagers, and, but he also took a special interest in, in seniors. Uh, his mother and grandmother, uh, uh, I'll overstate it, but he almost worshipped the ground they walked on. He, th he thought so highly of uh, his mother, especially. And I think a lot of his values actually went back to her, uh, Grandma Summers, and uh, being genuine, being humble. Those go right back to the roots. Well, and I think part of it also, I see this playing out in our organization today, is very much uh, values that Grandpa had and, and that you've carried on and hopefully have now moved a bit transferred in the third generation. When I say third generation, not just of the nuclear family, but of the larger Schlegel Village family. And I see that playing out all the time in our organization. Um, people interact with each other in a very kind of genuine, real way, mm -hmm. not putting on airs and pretenses and so on. And also how we relate to the outside world. We're seen as kind of honest um, brokers in the system. Uh, humble in terms of not thinking we have all the answers out there kind of beating our chest saying look at all the great things we're doing saying we're doing some interesting things and we're happy to share uh, to make the to make the sec sector of long-term care and retirement home uh, better and so we're, we come with an honesty of trying to 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 you know elevate the all, all boats <laughs> in the in the water <clears throat> and um, I think we're respected for that uh, by the broader health system. Uh, just the one thing I was going to say, when I think of, uh, of the values and humble, I think of Grandpa Schlegel, but I also think of my other grandparents. And uh, we learned a lot from Grandpa Schlegel, but also Grandma Schlegel was, uh, was very humble. And you talk about uh, taking an interest in people, she always did as well. And I think of Grandma and Grandpa Becker, and, and, and they were the same way. And uh, didn't, uh, didn't point out all the things they did and achieved in that, but just very humble about how they went about their, their uh, to-do uh, attitude and how, how they did things. And uh, we learned from all of them, and uh, that went through to uh, you, Dad, and Mom. And uh, growing up, we were, we were also taught that from, uh, from your generation. I don't think my father ever... Uh said, here, I want to have a talk with you. And then talked about his values. I never, he never talked about them. But uh, it was, he just, he lived it. And uh, um, he lived the values. And uh, so he never preached about them. Uh, but it just rubbed off. And, mm -hmm. and it, every day, you didn't even realize what you were seeing, but you were, you were obviously being influenced mm -hmm. uh, by his values. But at the time, you don't realize it. Yeah, the way he acted. Uh, but yeah, he just, he acted so genuinely towards people. One of the things, uh, when, you, when I think about humble and genuine um, Grandpa Schlegel, um, is it was never about him, right? To pick up on what you were saying, Dad. Uh, and he, he didn't do things for his own glorification or gratification. Uh, he did for others. And... You know, he was a real serving leader long before that term was coined. Um, and you see it in, you know, great leaders, how they can do that, how they can move people, inspire people, affect things um, by making it not about themselves. I was also going to say that, you know, as far as kind of deriving these values, one of the ways we did it originally and the test we put to it again was describing grandpa and dad, how would we describe them as people and the values they have? And that was kind of the, 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 the lens we brought to it when yeah. establishing these values.
Yeah, and that's where you can see them like being transgenerational, right? And being past, you, you mentioned the word, like you use the word like rubbing off, right? But mm-hmm. that's, you know, that's kind of, that seems to be the process, right? It's not necessarily conceptualizing them, you know, as, as theoretical values. But, you know, if you live the values day in and day out, it just starts to rub off. And, and, and Ron, you mentioned uh, the farm. And I think that's kind of a great uh, uh, lead into the second value, which is hard working and hands on. And if I remember from, you know, one of our earlier conversations, you were the little dude on the tractor, <laughs> right, who got stopped at some point in time because, you know, whoever was driving by thought it was a runaway tractor. <laughs> so, I mean, you grew up on a farm, you grew up, you know, doing chores and, uh, you know, and, and doing hard work and putting in some physical labor. Uh, it starts young. Uh, as you said, to take the runaway tractor time. Uh, I was... Uh, when I look back, I was only 10 years old when that happened. I was out in the field with this big tractor, about oh, 80 or 90 horsepower, had these big fenders, and I was sitting in the seat, and I couldn't see over the steering wheel. So I was looking through the steering wheel, and this car stopped on the highway, as you say, and came running over, thinking this tractor was a runaway tractor. And then when he got up close, he realized I was actually driving, the, driving it. But that was the reason I remember that so well. I was 10 years old, and uh, there was a tornado that came through, and I, I remember uh, driving home because I saw this big storm and I didn't know what it was about. And so I quickly unhooked the implement I was pulling and drove on the highway home and got home just before the tornado came. And uh, we, we, we were, were we taught to work or it was just part of the, part of uh, who we were and the, and the family, and we, we all pitched in. My brother, you know, older brother, he was uh, uh, seven years older. So he was 17. He was in, a, in another farm with a tractor, and he drove home as well. So, you know, there we were. We all pitched in. And also, Grandpa trusted you, um, you know, to give you chores and to give you a lot of independence, right? A lot of responsibility. A lot of responsibility. Yeah. And that was also something that uh, was part of the hard work was also the chance to prove yourself and to take on responsibility and to learn also sometimes from your mistakes. Mm-hmm. You were giving latitude. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and we talk a lot about uh, hard work in the organization as being a prerequisite. If you want to change the world for the better, it, it's going to take hard work mm-hmm. and a lot of passion to get into another. Uh, value and um, you know we're not going to just kind of go through the motions and expect to have you know disproportionately positive impact on the world. Right. So if we're serious about having that impact, we're going to have to all knuckle in and work hard together. And and it's the old saying that you know the whole family was working hard. It didn't seem as much like hard work when everybody was pitching in together. Mm-hmm. And you know that's part of the hands-on uh, part of that value as well is that. It means everyone's kind of in, in you know, working shoulder to shoulder. Mm-hmm. Doesn't matter if you're a, a, a general manager or a, or a director of nursing or a neighbor coordinator or a neighbor team member. Everyone's kind of in it together on the same team. Mm-hmm. And there's a certain equality I- in that, that no one's kind of above the other person. They're all on the same team, team working towards the same end. And that really speaks to the hands on part that we're all, right. we're all, we're all, um, expected to be hands-on if we're serious about mm-hmm. achieving our mission and changing the world. And building off what Jamie said, that's that's how we learned it. It wasn't uh, go and work hard. It was both grandpas or grandmas were there beside you working together with you, or dad, you and mom were beside us working with us. It wasn't go off and work hard. It was working hard together, and and, and Jamie's right. that That's kind of what's carried over to the homes and working hard with the uh, with the general managers through to the frontline workers to everybody it's not one set of go off and you work hard it's work hard together another one i remember from the 40s i think um i remember hearing it from you and for uh, from others was when the community um started to renovate the old church into a new church and and for you know the new congregation that grandpa was leading and as part of that very heavy renovation and remediation work, there was a lot of, you know, a lot of work to be done, a lot of hands-on work to be done. And Grandpa, as the leader, 
as opposed to kind of sitting back and telling people what to do. Yes, he helped organize for sure. He was a good organizer, but he actually, as a way of leading, took on the, the dirtiest and hardest job himself and the sweatiest job. Mm -hmm. and, the, and the one that was backbreaking, he took that one on himself and gave others perhaps lighter jobs. Um, that, that was his way of, um, of contributing for sure and showing that you know, he's not above anybody and, and he's willing to roll up the sleeves. Mm -hmm. And that says a lot about a leader to say, I'm going to, I'm going to take the, the, the toughest job for myself. Mm -hmm. You know, we can work hard individually, but together we can accomplish so much more. One time we were at the village of, of Wentworth Heights in Hamilton, and we were up at the Ruby and we were uh, about 10 o'clock and nine o'clock maybe at night. We're walking down the main street to leave the village and there was someone, there was some of the floor people, some of the housekeeping staff were cleaning the floor. And I just asked them something about, um, you know, how the machines working that they were working with there, uh, scrubbing and clean and polishing the floor. And I just thought it was the normal thing to do. I never even thought of it. But after, as we stepped out, someone said, that was amazing, that conversation you had with that housekeeping staff. But, you know, you, you can only do that by being out and about. Mm -hmm. and, being, and by being genuine and humble, back to the first. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And being interested. And walking the floor. Walking, being in the neighborhoods. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Connecting with the neighbor team members. Connecting with the teams that are actually in the... And talking to the residents, you know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like, what's making their day? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, what's, what are their struggles today, you know? Mm -hmm. um, that's the way you really... F everything I've learned has come from the seniors. Yeah. You know, they've been my teachers. There's an aphorism that says, the doctor learns much from his patient. And I think that's, that's what we got to remember that the seniors will teach us. Mm -hmm. it's, it's interesting, like I'm listening to you and I think we're, we're exactly in that situation that I described before, you know, when I, when I said like, you know, one of the hardest things in that entire process of, you know, talking about the values was really try to narrow them down and deal with overlaps. Yeah. And that's a natural lead over into the next uh, core value already. So as a matter of fact, we're actually talking about <laughs> caring relationships. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that's definitely something that we want to explore a little further. And we probably have to go back to the farm, you know, a small rural community where I think, you know, caring for each other and working collaboratively and having close relationships where well, that's that was part of, of daily life. Mutual aid, neighbor helping neighbor, farming, farmer helping farmer. Yeah, it's just what you do yeah. at, at the farm. You, you help your neighbor, you know, with uh, when they're uh, threshing and then everybody comes to your place when you're threshing. So it's just built right into into the community. But also it was beyond work, right? It was then you obviously got to know these people in various ways through work, through church, through community, etc. cetera. Um, and then knowing what's going on in their lives, mm -hmm. being able to support them through a difficult time or celebrate them with them during a good time. Um, that just all came kind of along with it, right? Mm -hmm. And there was that real kind of meshing and in the mesh is that support, right? That mm -hmm. uh, people are providing for each other. Um, you know, and, and that the foundation of it is, you know, the one-on-one -on -one relationships, but that is a strength then for, you know, an entire community to be built upon. Yeah. No, and, and again, bringing it to current day, I see it happening all the time in our organization amongst team members and leaders where there's just a real genuine uh, interest in each other mm -hmm. and a caring for and about each other where, you know, to Brad's point, when a team members going through a rough time uh, with health issues or, or personal or family issues, invariably the rest of the team kind of rallies around and supports them. And even uh, we've had lots of situations where someone has left the organization for one reason or another and they've fallen hard times and we st still have team members that will rally around them and support them even though they're not part of the organization anymore. Mm -hmm. And um, I think it's a real hallmark of organization is that uh, people care for each other more deeply and in a more enduring way than what you'd find in a typical work place. It resembles more a family sort of relationship. It's the Wilfrid Schlegel Hope Fund, if you want to. It's a good example. Yeah. Yeah, I was just going to say that's the ultimate. Uh, um, others uh, within the organization uh, supporting each other and that, that uh, just picks up on what Grandpa did, but in a more formal way. and. Uh, and as somebody's been down and, and uh, uh, you know, 
and needs a needs a hand up, um, it, people being there for them, and um, and how many people it's helped. That was certainly seated money that was seated by the Chicago family, but lots of team members contributed, lots of leaders contributed. Mm -hmm. It was a real team effort. Again, back to mutual aid, Dad, helping each other, and uh, for those everybody chipping in to help those who who needed it most, and that's kind of a very uh, obvious and formal kind of expression of that mm -hmm. value. It happens uh, informally and spontaneously all the time mm -hmm. in the organization, probably thousands of times during, in a day that we never even know about. No. We hear kind of some stories emerging from the villages, but um, I just hear team members say all the time they really feel care, cared for mm -hmm. in organization, that their, their contribution, their lives, their ambitions, their dreams matter. And uh, when people feel that way, they're also then more inclined to give more of themselves to the mission of the organization when they feel cared for by themselves. And that's not the Schlegel family doing it, that's the culture, that's everybody kind of contributing to the culture of caring. Mm -hmm. well, and then those yeah. values rub off on, like suppliers stepped up and yeah, uh, so. put money into the, the Hope Fund and others uh, saw value in it and stepped up. And uh, so it's, uh, Really interesting. It, it it evolved from much more than the family and and our uh, our coworkers. It uh, everybody that we had a relationship with and a partnership with um, saw value in it and stepped up and yeah. and we really supported each other. So exciting to see uh, how far it went. I hear stories stories from different team members uh, where they're not trying to impress me, but sort of in passing where. Maybe they um, they will buy things uh, for a sta for a resident when it's their birthday, or they'll take them out, you know, for some outing on their own time. You know, they come back, and uh, so these are these are genuine relationships, mm -hmm. you know, where they genuinely care uh, about the person, about the senior, the elderly person, and I hear so many examples where they're going over and above. You know, looking after helping the resident during their work shift, but then doing that over and above mm -hmm. uh, on their own time. Yeah, and I would say definitely for residents and for each other. And for each other. The, 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 how tightly knit our neighbor teams are is quite amazing. Yes. They, are, are, they are like, you know, little families in those neighborhoods where they're really caring for each other. And, and also residents caring for the team members. Mm -hmm. It goes uh, both directions. You see it all the time where, re where residents reach out and support team members, again, in, in good and, and more challenging times uh, because they want to be, they want to be full-fledged members of, the, of that neighborhood and, and contribute to those relationships as well. That's part of, uh, you know, relationships is, is not uh, one direction, it's multi-directional. Multi and it also, I think, shows respect to our elders that we allow them to care for us as well. Uh, because that's an important part of being human is caring for each other and allowing that to happen naturally. Um, and it radiates out really um, even beyond, you know, the individuals, it's interest, just like going back to grandpa and his interest in people. It's about their circumstances. It's about their family. It's about their family history, perhaps where they come from or these kinds of things, just being generally interested in somebody and knowing about them and the other thing I was going to mention quickly about uh, relationship uh, and relationship building is again the idea of it radiating beyond ourselves to our partnerships and our partners that we show interest in. Again, it's not what we can get from you, but what can we do together? Um, and who are you? <laughs> well, and who are who are yeah. you? First of all, of course, yeah. the the foundation yeah. and yeah. the value alignment that we talked about. But okay, when that alignment's there, what can we do together? What, what helps you and what could potentially help us or the idea of helping others uh, in the sector, as Jamie mentioned, get better altogether. It's not, you know, we're hoarding ideas, we're sharing them. Um, those are all part of uh, building relationships and also our relationship with the Ministry of Long-Term Care, taking, um, being very proactive and positive and collaborative in, in that relationship because we believe, honestly, that we all want to get to the same place or move in the same direction together. We're on the same journey. We all have our roles to play and our own perspectives on it, but let's share openly and be transparent with one another and try to move forward and find ways to work together. And I think um, that's really kind of, can be magical when that happens. The, uh, 
you know, we say caring relationships. We could also say genuine relationships, you know, where these values kind of merge, I guess. But uh, thinking back to my father again, um, he, uh, like I said earlier, he was very highly respected in the community. Uh, but people came to him for help, for advice, for help. And he genuinely cared for other people. And he gave of his own resources. Um, boy, I can remember many times where he would, he would give financially to people. He would uh, loan them money, sometimes never expecting it to be paid back. Uh, but to give them a chance. And uh, we, his five children had all the chances in the world, but there were others who didn't have much of a chance. And he's, he saw other people as part of our family, I guess. And uh, they would come to him, I remember, every night of the week. You know what, I think you have to be passion, passionate and you know, deeply caring uh, to really put in that level of work day in and day out and you know deal with the obstacles and the next uh, Set of core values is persistence and passion. I am, you know, I, I, I imagine that when you came up with the concept originally uh, There was also people who would you know question you and challenge you on the concept and say Yeah, you know what? We don't really believe in it because it is so different from what we've been doing all along and I'm sure that you know as we go through the evolution of Schlegel villages there were other obstacles too, where it needed, you know, passion and persistence uh, to really get past those obstacles. So if you want to fill us in a little bit on that context of passion and uh, persistence, I think that will be fantastic. Well, one, one story that strikes me, maybe the most of any in terms of persistence, at least it, it illustrates persistence, mm. is uh, when we were trying to get approvals for the village of Humber Heights in Etobicoke. And uh, that was an arduous process, a lot of community resistance and uh, fighting back. I think I described her uh, in another session, you know, the, the uh, black flags and all the big signs that were put up against Schlegel, go home to Kitchener, we don't want you. And uh, even my lawyer, who was, uh, our lawyer I should say, who was, who was handling the case and is one of the most successful lawyers for municipal approvals, uh, he said, let's go down to South Etobicoke so you don't have the resistance in the community. And uh, he said, this is too much to overcome. And I said, no, we're staying where we are because this is where the biggest need is in Etobicoke. And this is the right place this for is the right our place. The seniors to be. This is the right place for a village to be, to have the village concept and to have uh, be an integral part of the community in which it resides. So it's part of rather than some place that's built off to the side and separate from. And uh, so I said, no, we have to stay here. This is the right place. And so he said, well, okay. So he kept on arguing the case. We were five rounds at the Ontario Municipal Board and uh, we finally ended up winning. Uh, and today, all those neighbors, I don't have to tell our team members how they love Village of Humber Heights and uh, how the community relates to Humber Heights. At one time, it was total animosity. And uh, we just persisted, persisted, persisted. If it's the right thing to do, if it's the wrong thing to do, then you should learn a lesson and change course. But if it's the right thing to do, keep going. That's the single biggest factor in success, is persistence. Yeah, that's something you've mentioned before, just what you mentioned there at the end. And that is, and it's, there, there's been research um, done on this as well as anecdotal kind of study that, you know, the biggest factor, you said, in success, and success is not necessarily monetary success, it's, uh, or financial success, uh, you know, success, however you um, want to describe it, in our case, perhaps it's different and making an impact and changing the culture of aging, et cetera, is, is persistence. Now that's staying true to our values as our guide, as Jamie said, but and making decisions on those basis but then when we believe in something based on our values um we're willing to work hard to make it happen and um and, and it's you know the biggest single um, factor in success is not you know necessarily education or you know your expertise or your talent even those things are important but you have to be willing to persist at something in order to be to persist at something you have to be passionate about it 
and you need to have that energy. And it's not all, it's, it's rarely um, a loud version of that, you know, yelling and screaming and rah, rah. It's oftentimes a very quiet strength uh, and passion that um, is shown in the organization that's very stable. There's an undercurrent there, um, but there is an energy there. Uh, there's no two ways about it. It's going to take a lot of persistence to get there. And we have to know that and think um, the, the long game, not the short game, but think long term. And um, I think that's something that we have shown and something we're committed to. And I, and I hear that very well, all the time from family members and people who visit our villages who will comment on our, our team members and the word they oftentimes use to describe our team members is passionate. Mm -hmm. They're passionate about what they're doing, they're committed. Um, they just voluntarily use that descriptor. Mm -hmm. uh, when we are doing presentations to potential partners or decision makers, policy makers in the Ministry of Long-Term Care or, or seniors in accessibility, um, oftentimes we'll finish a presentation and they'll say something, wow, you guys are really passionate about mm -hmm. <laughs> this, your village concept, passionate about your community hub, health hub model passionate about research and, uh, and practice and education integration. Oftentimes people feed that back to us as a description mm -hmm. of, of, our, of our leadership as well. Mm -hmm. But I think it's important, as Brad said, like it's, uh, if you really believe in what you're doing, that it's the right thing to do, it's the right thing to benefit the community and society, um, then you have a passion that burns brightly, that, that mm -hmm. kind of that pushes you forward yeah. through kind of those periods of resistance and challenge. Mm -hmm. I was just going to say that when I think of uh, persistence and passion, uh, first of all, I, I think of dad because you're the most persistent person uh, I know, but uh, I think Research Institute for Aging and your passion for it and all the obstacles that were in your way and you never let it get you down. And, and whether it was how it got set up in the first place and the university not really understanding what you wanted and what your vision was, but you didn't let that get you down. You just pushed harder and, and uh, came at it a different way and, and just kept explaining it to them till we eventually got there. And then in terms of the physical facility and getting the beds required from the Ministry of Health, and I don't know how many times they said no to you, but you never let it get to you and you just kept going back and you just kept thinking there's gotta be a different way to come at it. You know, but I think of passion and, and, and persistence at the end of the day yeah. And RIA has got to be one of the top things yeah. that I think of when I, when I think yeah, of that's that. A good, that's a great insight that, you know, Humber Heights is a good example. RIA is an equally, if not better example uh, over time of the persistence and passion that shone through uh, with you. And then I was joining in, like David being a key partner, David Johnston mm -hmm. being a key partner and, and getting, the, getting the RIA established and, the, and getting the University Gates Center of Excellence started. Now... The way the research institute, the RA, has blossomed, um, it's the shining beacon. You know, it, it's what's putting us on the map internationally. You know, with all the Chinese delegations and Australian delegations and others who come over to see the RA and uh, how it's how research leads into innovation, and that all came about through. That wasn't six months worth of effort. It was maybe six years of effort. It was a mm -hmm. lot, long time. The other thing I was going to say, just to end off maybe about persistence and passion, is that passion is contagious. So if you feel passion from somebody, it can really inspire others. Um, but believing in something and being persistent and passionate about it doesn't mean that you don't listen to others and collaborate with others and learn from others. And be open-minded to being open-minded to learning new things for sure. Yeah, to be to learning and input and insights from others. Right. And so that is that is not. Yeah, it's not about being stubborn and closed-minded. In fact, exactly. it's quite the opposite. Yeah, that's a good point. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Now, one of you mentioned previously that the the values that we're talking about right now that they're kind of all feeding into the vision and the mission of the organization, right? So we're talking about about drivers for the actual mission and vision. And uh, we've looked at some of those drivers and another driver is a positive can-do attitude. Because mm -hmm. um, purpose needs a driver. Um, I think that's been, uh, we've established that. 
um, and uh, a positive can-do attitude, that can be a driver that really makes, uh, makes all the difference in the world. For uh, a positive attitude, again, my father, he was positive on most everything. You know, if it was realistic, mm -hmm. uh, he was positive. He took the positive view on life rather than sort of what's all wrong with life. He looked for what was right with life. Mum showed uh, a lot of persistence for sure mm -hmm. through her illness and uh, what's been not an easy life along the way as well. And um, has always demonstrated a positive can-do attitude. As you said, the kind of the corny phrase of making lemonade from lemons, yeah. it really applies in her case. She turned what was a very difficult situation around and has made um, a life of purpose and meaning in her own way mm -hmm. uh, through her positivity. Yeah, no, she was, you know, she had her, had a, had that serious stroke at age 39, so that was young, and uh, could have become a very, ne could have become a very negative person, and would have had Eddie have had every right yeah. to be negative, yeah. but chose not to be. It was a choice. I was going to say that um, going back to Grandpa and to you, Dad, um, looking at um, things in a positive light looking at opportunities as well, where a lot of people saw problems and saw the negative and things. Grandpa was able to set his mind on the positive, probably because that's where his mind was mm -hmm. in, that, uh, in that frame of mind. But he saw the possibilities in things mm -hmm. where other people saw drawbacks and that allowed him to develop a lot of things that other people would have not trusted themselves to do. Um, but also I think more importantly, you mentioned about seeing the good things in people. Mm -hmm. Because as humans, we oftentimes have a tendency to focus on the negative aspects of others. The faults, the weaknesses, the... And focus on those. And, and he had um, part of his faith, but also just part, part of his personality, the gift of seeing the positive mm -hmm. in people. Not only that, but um, bringing out those positives by encouragement and by belief in people and by, be, by, tr by trusting people. Mm -hmm. And I think that is uh, something that uh, you've exhibited and Grandpa and has and, and did, and you know, something that inspires me, but I think also a lot of others uh, in our organization. Yeah, and I've seen, you know, again, some current examples, how our village teams, how our leadership teams uh, at support office have, uh, through incredibly challenging times have maintained a positive can-do approach. Mm -hmm. In fact, encouraging each other. I've, I've seen along the way, can we, you know, we gotta, we're gonna get through this together. We're gonna mm -hmm. find a way through this. We're gonna get on the other side of this and be better for it and, and being overt about encouraging each other and to, to remain positive. And you think about it, they, uh, it's a lot more fun working around and with people who are positive. Sure, mm -hmm. and attracts and, other people who are positive, and, right? And there's it's, nothing yeah. worse than having negative people around you. And uh, in fact, some counselors will say, get away from the negative people. You know, they drag you down, but the positives lift you up. And it's a lot more fun. For sure. When you have positives around you. A lot more rewarding and frankly, a lot more effective. Yeah. So we're getting to our final set of values, creative and innovative. Now, Ron, going back to your dad, um, you shared the story and the characterization of your dad as a, as a social entrepreneur. And you actually made that point uh, where you said, well, he was a social entrepreneur before that concept even existed. Mm -hmm. I mean, that going back to your dad's generation, that speaks to creativity and an innovative spirit. Now, you know, when we had conversations and, you know, we kind of started to zoom in on the, the village concept, I mean, that was innovative, that was creative, that was new at the time. And there has been a series of ongoing innovations. Um, you know, if you look at the overall evolution of your organization, it has been innovations all along. Yeah, well, he was, you again, my dad was a very creative person. And uh, he wasn't afraid to try new things. And uh, uh, talking about picking beans and peas that I mentioned earlier, like that just came in as something that you could get some better returns on them than by growing wheat and corn and uh, but he was willing to try those things he was the first in the community who would we grew fields of peas and uh, he tried that and uh, most of the time he succeeded um, but he was always sort of on the 
front guard trying things and then and then sharing that with other people as well um, but uh, I think that uh, the, our research institute as much as anything you know we always say research drives innovation that some people organizations innovate uh, with sort of the latest flavor of the month thing but we uh, we always feel that it needs to be evidence-based research driven innovation so it's so it's solid it's not just the flavor of the month thing and uh, it's needing some very creative uh, things in our in our programs like the PAL program for example you know very innovative and and uh, that grew out of the research we're doing and uh, Jamie you probably have lots of examples of uh, creativity and innovation yeah no for sure and uh you know, what I love about this particular value, it's really a mindset. Mm -hmm. I think the RAA uh, and interacting research into our villages and having the, the team members and residents, you know, come alongside the researchers to, to engage in the process of discovery um, creates a, a mindset of innovation mm -hmm. and of creativity, critical inquiry. and. Um, and then our team members start looking at things differently. So how can we actually do that a little bit better? Mm -hmm. And and creativity and innovation oftentimes is not kind of um, glamorous. It's not some big research study. In fact, it's some minor tweak that makes things just a little bit better today than they were yesterday. And it's because the team members were you know, had that mindset of how can we do things a little bit better today than we did yesterday, and and tomorrow a little bit better again. And through the accumulation of those efforts, we get uh, we get better and better. This continu this continuous improvement that occurs, some of it driven by research, some of it just driven by that culture of of innovation that creates that mindset within with not just within leadership but within neighbor team members. A lot of our best ideas, not surprisingly, come from the experts in our organization who are our neighbor team members who are on the front lines of delivering our our mission, and uh, they have the many times the best insights in terms of uh, how we can change things for the for the better so to me it's 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 and that's why we say creativity and innovation because innovation kind of gives the connotation of kind of bigger kind of more glamorous sort of initiatives whereas creativity is more kind of that mindset of just you know constant improvement mm -hmm. and uh, you know I could give lots of examples frankly leadership in our villages could give far more examples than what I could of how a creative and innovation is is spawning improvement every every day of the year. Yeah, one of the things uh, I think of when I think of the creative and innovative is is uh, you guys in the design of the new homes and Brad leading that and uh, with a lot of uh, help from Richard Hammond and and Dad and and Jamie and and the way you tackle one thing and 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 try to innovate as you get into the next one, but not it's just not the uh, Four of you doing it, it's uh, the uh, imitation from people in, on the front lines to work with you and help you think better and come up with better solutions. And um, it's always kind of neat to see how we evolve and innovate and take things to the next level. I, I think Rob, Rob's right, the innovation takes many different forms. It's in the innovations around how we evolve the village concept, how we design them. It's around the Research Institute, um, Living Classrooms, a fantastic example of creativity and innovation, a new way of training and future healthcare workers uh, such that they'll be far more effective um, uh, healthcare providers when they graduate mm -hmm. uh, through to program innovations, the Living in My Today dementia philosophy. It's a great example of a world, I would describe as a world leading, a f not program, but really a philosophy of, of dementia care, mm -hmm. how we treat those living with dementia and the types of environments we create for them so they can thrive as individuals. So it is so the creativity and innovation cuts across all these different dimensions of the villages, mm -hmm. design, program, clinical care, uh, education, uh, partnerships and so on. So it really kind of infuses all these different components of the organization and it takes, again, not just the four people sitting here, but in fact, everyone in the organization with that mindset of, of improvement and, mm -hmm. and creativity. 
Well, and it's iterative, right? Um, I mean, the RIA is built on that. It's not, you know, research necessarily coming on, down from on high all the time. It's multi-directional. It's oftentimes informed by um, our team members in the village, ideas they have. Um, and but I wanted to pick up on something that Rob said. You've said in the past before, um, and that is there also needs to be kind of an invitation or a license to innovate mm -hmm. um, through the organization. And the idea that um, it's okay to try something. No, it's good, sorry, it's good to try something if it's thought through and discussed, good to try something. And we also realize that sometimes it won't work. And we're willing to take those risks as an organization in order to get better. And sometimes even though it hasn't worked necessarily the way you thought it would, there's learnings from that process that can then direct the next step. So it's inv the invitation to innovate, it's also the license to try and to fail and to learn from that. And creating that, yeah, creating that supportive environment where people feel that they can take some risks and try new things. And they might succeed, hopefully they will, and if they don't, we'll learn from it and get better as a result. And it's, it's, it's beyond being a part of the culture, which, you know, really, really, you know, melds it into our souls. Um, but also we set up very systematic processes to uh, facilitate it. For example, we have a research to practice group, and we have a, a person who is, who is a specialist in that area of, of innovation. And uh, uh, so, uh, you know, the research to practice group is continually looking at how can we apply the research and vice versa, what are some of the real issues uh, in, in frontline care and quality of life that we need to uh, put into the research arena to uh, study it more carefully. Yeah, that's a good point. It's not, it's not just kind of a mushy cultural thing. There's also some hard systems kind of that are supporting it as well. It, it operates at both those in both those domains. Yeah. Good plan. Yeah, it's fun. I mean, um, Rob, you talked about the the world in which I live, and on, on the design side and the construction side, um, to you know pull together a, a conceptual, a preliminary design for a new village, um, taking in our latest thinking as a design group and the lessons of previous villages and what's working and feedback we're getting, but to put that in front of you know, our operational team and to bring their kind of experience from the villages to that process to critique the plan, to give new ideas. We always say we're open to ideas large and small. Nothing's too large, nothing's too small to share at that table. Um, it's really interesting um, to be part of that process and to ask the questions. And you said that, and why did you say that? Or, or did, you know, or if we were to try it this way, would that, you know, help in this problem? or? Those kinds of things. It leads to very interesting discussion. Very much a team effort as well. Very much a team effort, and I think um, our team members appreciate the opportunity also to provide that feedback. Um, that's part of the reason we do it, but it's yeah. more importantly just to get better. At, at well, and it's also far more interesting mm -hmm. and much more fun, <laughs> rather than just kind of again kind of repeating what's happened, what we've done in the past successfully, but in fact trying to get better than ourselves, and uh, that's that's more rewarding and more interesting. I was going to just add a comment, duly, uh, sort of a general comment. If I look at these values, genuine and humble, hardworking and hands-on, caring relationships, persistent and passionate, positive can-do attitude, and creative and innovative. Uh, I see them in spades in my day when I look back, and I see them in spades with my sons going forward. And uh, so, uh, yeah, we see these things in our culture and in our team members, but it also takes leadership who uh, believe honestly in what we're doing. And so it's something you live and you breathe and uh, you don't lecture. And uh, we, I see it in, like I said, looking back and I also see it looking forward. Yeah, and I would just pick up and then say, um, you see it in, in the three of us and, and we all see it in the leaders at support office and. Think of the core team. You know, they're 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 living those values ingrained in them. They live the values every bit as much as the four of us do. Think of the the village leadership or the GMs and AGMs, and they're living the values every day, just like like we are. It's infused through the organization, and that's what gives it the really the the, the power that it has, the power of the family culture. 
Yeah, because you ultimately communicate the values from the from the inside out, right? Mm -hmm. And I think this is the interesting thing. If you know, you asked me for you know my conclusions from our conversation that we're just having. If there's one thing that I would take home is, you know, as long as you really live your values and you know your values are organic, uh, you will never fall short in terms of communicating them from the inside out and inspiring people in that process. So I want to thank you, Brad, Ron, Rob, Jamie, for another great session. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I hope uh, the viewers are gonna enjoy it as much as, uh, as we did.